Welcome everyone to episode four of the Independent Black Filmmakers Collective Game Changers Series 2022. Today we have cutting edge um, speakers who are in an area that is very exciting, um, who've been pioneers in their fields. We have Isabel Rock and Cabela Marker. Uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction um, and then they're going to have a conversation with each other, after which, uh, right at the end, the last 15 minutes, we ask you to please think of questions that you'd like to ask of them, and I will moderate that and um, we'll get answers and insights uh, from them. Um, Isabel, uh, is the founder and owner of Enlightened Poppy. She's a SAFTA winner for Best Animation. She's also uh, on the board of Animation SA. Uh, she's been a pioneer in this field. I actually met Isabel at the Cosmopolitan Woman of the Year. I, I can't remember the year, Isabel, <laughs> some decades ago. The a Isabel long time ago. A very long time ago. Uh, but Isabel's been... Um, pushing the boundaries and trying to create pathways and transformation in this area. Uh, Cabello is an anime, sorry, is an animation director, 2D animator, illustrator, podcaster, and she's an animation lecturer. So we have people who are right at the cutting edge, um, making a way literally from no way. <laughs> so we're very excited to have you both here um, to share some of your experiences and your insights. Um, and, and yeah, it's, it's really exciting to have the both of you. Um, we're now going to go to the clips, which they're going to share some of their work with us. And we'll jump in right after that into your conversation. Tunde? Hey Sam, will you ever get paid again? I keep feeling the same thing. Of us, go ask my dollar because you know it's a turn. The last time, my tail got burned. Hey, Joe, I can't call the fuck. The last time, you gave me a scum. Maybe if you sing a song, he'll throw us a bow. Lose that kid. Don't get food again. To learn more about Pablo Studios short films, go to pablostudios.com or
So those are our clips, everybody. That last one was mine. The Little Teaspoon of Sugar uh, was a short film that I finished last year. So we'll just jump right into the, <laughs> the conversation. Thank you for having us uh, this afternoon. I'm Cabello Maca, the founder of Cablo Studios, which is an award-winning uh, animation and illustration studio based in Johannesburg. And we create short films, we create um, series, and we also specialize in medical animation. And um, I run the business with my mom, actually. We've been do going since 2017. And my mother is an actual doctor, but uh, she does business development for us. And there's eight of us right now in the team. Um, and actually, I met Isabel at the Cape Town Animation Festival. It was just when I was starting out in 2017. Um, and she turned out to be a really good person to meet um, in the industry as a person, as a young woman starting out. Um, yeah, so Isabel, I'm sure you'll want to introduce yourself, then we can have the conversation. Um, and Well, I've been introduced by McGinty, so I, I want to get straight into, like, <laughs> what is it like working with your mother? I mean, business partnership is probably one of the most critical things to get right. And to get it right with your mother takes a real special kind of relationship. I think one of the great things of that is that there's at least you know there's values alignment, which is one of the key things of getting business partnership right. But what has it been like running a business with your mom? <laughs> That's usually the first question people ask us. Um, I think because my mom and I actually have a really good relationship in general and are aware of each other's differences and um, like where we can fill in our gaps. So to be able to work together in business has actually almost been like a natural um, expression of that relationship that we have as mother and daughter. But it's not always that easy because how do you uh, come into agreement? How do you solve a problem? Whose opinion do you take? Which direction do you choose? But because I'm more of the creative, I am... Um, the technical person and she's the find the networks find the clients um we're able to kind of delegate the work um well but it's also like what you said is about the fact that she's my mom we do have aligned values and so finding a solution uh comes back to those values what are we trying to do where are we trying to go what's the end goal of this particular film or this particular mm -hmm. um strategy that we're following it goes back to those values but yeah it has its fun times it has its challenging times <laughs> but um the one thing is at least for me your mom is someone who has your back so she started out being a momager and ended up being an integral part of the business um, but what about you you know how how do you go running solo and doing so many things all at once as one person Oh my gosh, yeah, that I must admit is one of the biggest challenges of my new business uh, venture. Because when I first started in the animation industry, I was really blessed um, to have met a really strong business partner and having that, that business partner where our values met, uh, we had strengths and weaknesses that uh, complemented each other. So that's one of my big challenges is having to run a business on my own now. Um, and hence my evolution into the industry organization because I saw the amount of industry challenges that needed to be addressed. And so I thought it was more vital in terms of my direction and where I wanted to go was to rather address industry challenges, um, especially barriers to entry and the, the barriers that continue across the value chain. Um, so looking at interventions that reduce that but it was definitely a hell of a lot better having a business business partner, um, even though he was a little bit of a grumpy face. <laughs> That's a special <laughs> shout out to him, but he was an amazing business partner. Um, but yeah, having gone through that experience, I think uh, laid the foundations for where I am today because in running a studio for 10 years and growing at 400%, I remember my accountant saying, Do you, are you guys aware that you're growing at 400% a year? Wow. And I'm just like, yeah, maybe that's why we're so tired and burnt out all the time. <laughs> um, so yeah, just uh, having run a studio for 10 years and, and looking at all of the challenges that small studios and especially scaling studios uh, deal with, 
uh, when I left the industry in 2010, um, I took a long break, which was one of the greatest gifts I could have given to myself, um, because that really allowed me to look at the industry from a distance and really analyze some of the ecosystem challenges, value chain challenges, uh, which then, you know, when I started, and I didn't really want to come back into the industry. I was like, I lost a lot of money in the global economic crisis to this industry. <laughs> and nobody seemed to care. Oh, wow. <laughs> so when my studio shut down in 2010, I took me like three, four years before I was like, okay. When it clicked in my head, where I was like, okay. Because I remember saying, I'm not going back into that industry until the business model makes sense. And the business model wasn't making sense back then. So I uh, fortunately also got pregnant. And so also during that pregnancy time, I took time out for full-time motherhood. So I, I really took out a lot of time for myself. And uh, during that time, it kind of, you know, the strategy started ruminating in my brain. And I started looking at what were some of the ecosystem blocks, what were some of the value chain blocks, and what kind of interventions were needed to assist, especially small and black studios, to getting through those entry barriers and those continuous growth barriers along the value chain. So yeah, once it clicked in my brain, I was like, actually, I don't want to run another studio. I wanna make sure that other people's projects get through all of the different hoops and challenges that our value chain uh, and ecosystem presents and help get them to that finish line. So that's actually, uh, how my work started in it. Yeah, I actually, I really like how you brought up the ecosystem because um, that's something I've started talking to um, with university students. Um, this year, I've started doing like tours. I, I was talking at um, Oakfields College and um, I did some stuff with Stadio and I'm looking for other universities to speak at. And the topic that I thought I would talk to the students about is about the ecosystem because I came in as an artist and I was like, okay, I'm starting a company because I don't want to be unemployed because I'm a graduate and I'm not trying to be a statistic. But then all of these things that were coming at me that, that had to do with running a business, with understanding where you fit in the value chain, how do you actually deal with clients, what else is happening around you other than production, um, which was if I hadn't actually met you at Animation Essay and then saw I mean, at Cape Town Animation Festival, heard about Animation Essay and then saw what else was happening in the industry. I wouldn't have a much bigger picture of where I play as somebody who owns a production studio. What's happening before me? What's happening afterwards? What's, what's there to support my journey? Um, and so I started talking to um, university students specifically about the ecosystem and I have this slide where I was like, this is an animation ecosystem. In the middle, I put production and then I left gaps all around. And I was like, okay, you guys tell me what are some things that you think would fit in all these gaps and all of them listed things that were in production from pre-production to post but none of only one person mentioned distribution so nobody knew about financing they didn't know about animation SA and an African animation network and how they give support they didn't know what happens when there's distribution and full markets and how you actually sell your animations um, and I just it just made me realize that the gap in information about the business of animation, how do you actually make sure that this thing that you're doing is profitable and sustainable? There's a huge gap in information. Um, yeah. And um, I didn't know I didn't I was just assuming that they wouldn't know, but um, actually asking them and realizing that indeed the students didn't know it confirmed what I um had a hunch about that indeed there's a there's a, a gap in information about the business yeah. there's yeah. a huge lack and that's that's one of the failings of the schools where there's just no education around the actual business of show business and you know the value chain and and this is why one of the things i started challenging a few years ago when i started speaking on different government platforms to raise their awareness to the fact that the value chain that exists on the internet that every young person would go to and use is very misleading. You know, it's the traditional development, uh, uh, pre-production, pre production, production uh, um, post-production, licensing, merchandising, marketing, distribution. And mm. so in their minds, they think that those things actually are at the end of the value chain. And so they start preparing their projects, doing development only as, you know, uh, Bibles, treatments, scripts, et cetera, and then going into production with that in mind, uh, 
um, which of course has revealed itself as an industry that's kind of more, I would say an NGO industry. I mean, even if we look at the live action industry, because I think this is relevant to both um, and the animation industry in terms of the amount of projects that break even, that get a return on investment, that become the multiple brands that animation has the potential to become is very limited. And that for me starts at value chain because uh, you know after speaking on multiple platforms and realizing, okay, this is you know, a limited space and I need to prove concept. And so I've incorporated that into my incubator where I have moved everything in the end of the value chain right up front into, into development. So this course has massive ramifications in the industry because it then means now you've got to do your licensing and merchandising strategy. You've got to do your marketing strategy. You've got to do your business modeling. Um, you know, all of these things that basically is creating a business plan and has all of the support documents that show how you're going to get that return on investment. And so that, is, that has been a game changer in terms of uh, just, you know, the incubator and, and sort of testing, testing the proof of that pudding. Um, because now, you know, as money is making itself available um, and some of the SMMEs who are a little bit ahead of the others had their business plans ready, had all of those supporting documents. And so they were ready to, to get access to that money. I mean, the money came three months before we were ready and we were given five days to finalize what we would have done in three months. But, you know, you got to do what you got to do. But they had the basics were there. So it was just about, you know, we putting it together and making it a, a, a strong enough model. So yeah, the value chain shift is critical, I think both for animation and live action and the schools need to shift. So that has implications, for instance, in now how you train at schools, you know, that has implications on the NFEF and putting marketing at the end. You got to apply for marketing only after your production. That's ridiculous, not in this day and age. Like we're in an age where your marketing has to start early. Start at the beginning. Front especially mm -hmm. for animation, because mm -hmm. we've got assets that we can start exploiting. And so, and that's one of the things within the incubator that I was looking at is, you know, I called it the road to commercialization and broadcast readiness incubator because um, I wanted to look at how do we commercialize the various assets of the animation brand and not see it as a project or just a TV series or just a film, but see it as a brand, it, it's, it's an octopus with multiple tentacles. And how do we start to explore very early on all of the income streams that we can look at um, in that? So the commercialization element, so that then brings in e-commerce and brings in your licensing and merchandising because you've designed your characters, you've got your look and feel. So mm -hmm. from that becomes a nice step into now let's look at our merchandising strategy and what kind of toys, apparel, clothing, just the whole range of different things you could exploit from that. And then looking at that e-commerce opportunity and linking your marketing strategy to that, to mm -hmm. drive that, but also using it as an opportunity to build your audience, to educate your audience, mm -hmm. to keep them booked with various elements of the process of, you know, the development, the long, what I call a elephant pregnancy in animation. And taking that to, taking your audience on that journey till broadcast so that you're not just like new, never been heard of and suddenly on broadcast and, you know, you've just had a few months of marketing ramp up. I'm like, that's, that's ridiculous. You're setting yourself up for failure if you do that. So yeah, really just uh, shifting, shifting models and shifting things. Um, but I think one of the cool things I really liked about you when I met you, I was like, ah, oh, not only are they black female duo, <laughs> they also found a niche market in the animation field, which I really loved. And I was like, this is something special. So maybe you can tell us a bit about that kind of medical niche that you guys have found yourself in. Sure. Um, I, I just wanted to comment on what you said about think about those things that you usually think about at the end think about them in the beginning because at the end of the day the animation that you have is a product um and so you need to sell that product and so you need to think about that at the very beginning and for us um we it's interesting because my mom's a doctor and my mom was just going to be like chris jenner and help me uh, find work as I sort of started this journey. But then she realized that maybe animation could be used to communicate within her industry. And so then she said, Gabelo, what if you did medical animation? And I was like, meh, meh, I wanna make films, I wanna make TV shows and to be a storyteller. 
but I, I couldn't deny how brilliant it was as a, our, as our unique way of entering into the industry because animation is very competitive and I'm not competing with South Africans. I'm competing with the rest of the world, even if I'm in South Africa. And so then I did that pilot project for her where I explained what she does as an anesthetist. Um, and we did that animation and, and then I realized, okay, cool. This is, this is um, not quite like explainers because we still do storytelling. We don't just purely teach, but we do stories within medicine. But it was a way for us to use animation, not just as this thing that's purely for entertainment, but as a communication tool. And then because we've got Dr. T, who's um, a medical doctor, that sort of understanding of medicine and the that whole field and which sort of people we could approach with our service of medical animation, it's inbuilt within our business model. And so when we approach um, a pharmaceutical or they approach us or we approach hospitals or universities even, because we've started working with universities, um, you, you can talk to them in their language because medicine is built into what we do. And then because I'm an animator and, our, and we have animators in the studio and we just think simply in terms of storytelling it helps us to then take that complicated information that's just too heavy and a bit intimidating and it helps us to then take that and simplify it in a way that's entertaining that's fun that's got charming characters um and it really worked as a as a a way to differentiate ourselves from the competition the other day um i was I was I follow Chris Doe on LinkedIn, the the graphic design guru, business person, and he was like, uh, one time you should try googling yourself without the the words that you think um, like like without direct words, without saying Gabelo, without saying Cablo Studios, and I tried googling um, black female animation studio, and it didn't come up. Then I tried googling medical animation. And it, and ours came up at the top and I thought, okay, I've been pushing the message of medical animation more than I've been pushing black and female. And actually it was, it was quite nice to see that I, that, that, um, that, that uh, niche, there we go, that we have as a studio is a thing that we're becoming known for. Even if we end up doing other things, we know that medical animation is that original bread and butter of the studio. Um, and so now it's about how do we scale up? What more can we do? And, and how do we also engage? Because like the nice thing about our business is we can engage with the medical side and we can also engage with film and media and entertainment. So now because we're trying to grow, it's like, how do we engage those both sides so that we can then grow as a studio and, and improve? But yeah, it, it was, it was a, it was a, um, a really clever idea that Dr. T had. I, I have to, I have to say it was from God, honestly. <laughs> yeah. Well, one um, of the other cool things that you branched out into was creating the residency. I was observing that during lockdown. Hey? That was really cool. Yes, yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Um, it's because I've always wanted to do a residency. And because I couldn't do one, I was like, let's maybe do one for other people. And it was also because when we created our first short film, this context for everybody, uh, we created our first short film, Three Teaspoons of Sugar. And it got really brilliant reception. It got into Annecy um, International Animation Festival, which is pretty much the biggest animation festival in the world. It's in France. In, and um, that then allowed us to get a whole lot of clients in 2020 who are in the medical industry. Um, and so it's true, your short films are like a showreel piece that help you get work. Um, and so then because I saw, okay, cool, we made a short film. So now it means all the government funding, GFC, NFVF, all of that, we're now, uh, we now can qualify for some of that funding because we're no longer new entrants. We're like tier two um, in their sort of categories where they give funding. But then also we had these clients who were approaching us because they saw we, we made a, a well-received finished product. And so then these clients approached us. And then I thought, why don't we repeat this for somebody else? Uh, why don't we make a residency program where we help 
um, recent graduates or junior professionals create their first short film so that their barrier of entry into the industry is um, eliminated or is, is less. Because a lot of the times when you do apply for these funding, they'll say, have you finished the short film? Have you done this sort of commercial project? And if you haven't, then it's very hard to access those things. So that was the reason for the residency to create um, the same opportunity for somebody else. And then what ended up happening from there is some of those films have become uh, award-winning, are going, excuse me, going to festivals, but we also then hired some of those residents. So we had five residents. We hired three of them full-time at Cablo Studios, and then two of them actually went on to find work elsewhere where they're still working now. So I, I guess I could say the residency produced 100% employment. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's that's impact. <laughs> thank you, but it's it's um, it was because I just wanted to repeat that um, same effect that we had for other people, and it also makes me think of some of the stuff that you you have done as well. Um, some of our residents that we had were part of the internship program that you did with Tim Lurong. Um, so maybe you can also talk about that and tell everybody about it. Um, I just want to share a quote that I read today that I thought was it just like it really stuck with me was that nobody gets ready by waiting. You only get ready by starting. Yes. And I, like most of my career in animation has been about that where it's just like I got into the animation industry and this will be interesting, interesting for live action people where I do not come from an animation background. I cannot draw. I, you know, I'm not even a technology kind of fundy person. Um, I just loved writing and I loved broadcast medium and I loved animation. And I was like, well, I hate journalism, so <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> and I just uh, dove in, started writing business plan on the vision of the business plan that I, a business I wanted, entered business plan competitions. And by entering those business plan competitions, every time I got closer and closer to winning, I just kept entering because it kept making me refine the model and the strategy and how I was going to do it. So by the time I made it to being the second runner up and a B company beat me, I was like, okay, I'm done. I made it to the top. I can now get on with just, just do it. Um, and actually we had started, uh, even though we were submitting to the competition, we just started. And, and one of the things we started, we realized, okay, this is a very expensive industry. So mm -hmm. one of us has to keep their job and one of us has to start the business. So fortunately, Doomy's company uh, that he was with, he had left and I said, well, why look for another job? Just start the, the business. We've been talking about this for a while. Um, so he started and I sort of kept the expenses running by working for, and it only took six months before we got our first client. And I was like, if we can get one client, we can get more. Yes. And the rest, as they say, is history. So yeah, for live action people, I think that they, they offer a really amazing opportunity uh, to look at what opportunities are there in the animation industry. Because people always think that it's just about animating and it's just about, you know, the, the technical and creative components of it. But there's so much more that we have critical skills shortage in, you know, production managers, the same skills you have in production managing a live action. It's really just a, a software and systems and it's something you can learn and mm. adapt to. Um, even producing, you know, I've produced for live action and it's, it's a lot more stressful than producing for animation. My God, live action is like herding cats. That's what I call them. <laughs> Whereas animation is like a calm, zen environment. We have elephant pregnancies as opposed to <laughs> live action. It's like three months, this baby better be out there running. <laughs> so yeah, I think that our industry really offers a, a great opportunity for live action people to look at, you know, even directing. My producer, who uh, is one of the coaches in my incubator, he comes from a live action background and he did the shift into animation. And he, one of the projects he worked on, Jabu's Jungle, uh, uh, has something like 3 million subscribers and 3 billion views. Wow. You know, that's incredible. Um, the, the production has reached a point now where they earn from their YouTube channel um, and are able to put that into their production. So, you know, there is that value that live action people can come into. And I think that's one of the things that we should look at as an industry body is creating a bridge 
uh, for other people from different industries to come into our industry. I mean, one of my incubates is a woman, Zama Mafusi from Indilang, who's creating a nursery rhymes uh, channel, African nursery rhymes. And she comes from an engineering background. She's a mechanical engineer. And the structural thinking of what she brings has made her achieve way more at a faster rate than everybody else, because everybody else is like they're animators, they're creatives, they know, you know, so they take a lot for granted. Whereas with her, with each of her sessions with her coaches, she asks all of those tough, critical questions and she gets them to do a lot of work for her because she just doesn't know that, you know, this is coaching, not like you know, operational <laughs> implementation for you. But she's managed to get so much more out of her coaches just because she came from a different industry. So it's 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 like that thing where they say uh, uh, when single mothers have a baby, they struggle so much more than single fathers. But it's because single fathers don't know. So they ask for a lot of help and they, they get a lot of people to kind of give them input. So it's the same thing, I think. You know, I'd really like to encourage the live action community to look at what opportunities there are. And also our industries are bleeding into each other. So many films now and uh, TV series are incorporating animation. There's so many solutions you can have done with animation in your, your series that, um, you know, people do it in live action. It's like, actually, uh, there is a solution uh, in animation. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it's... Uh, it's a really exciting time, don't you think, to be in the animation industry? I do, especially because it maybe this sounds a bit cynical, but because diversity is fashionable right now. Um, so for those of us who are the historically underrepresented group of people, it's like a really great opportunity to um, like mm -hmm. maximize on all of the the. Um, the grants that come up or the competitions that come up or the conversations that we're now allowed to have, whether it's something like this, where we get to be in sort of a panel discussion and talk and from, about our experiences or um, uh, uh, next month, I'm doing a talk for Cardiff um, Animation Festival and it's in connection with the Cape Town International Animation Festival. And it's about animation with purpose. And it's because of, the fact that we do medical animation and we do these films that have a greater purpose than just entertaining. But all that to say, I, I do feel like it's a great time for us in animation because um, the world is looking for African storytellers, for people who don't usually have a chance to tell stories. Now they're looking for that. So I just feel like I chose a good time to to decide to <laughs> to be a business owner, although it has its, it has its challenges and they've been um, a lot of learning curves. Uh, for example, I came into this as somebody who studied to be an animator and not necessarily to be a business owner. Oh, Isabel, are you still there? You cut off. Oh, you're still there. Okay. Um, I, I studied to be an animator, technical person, an artist, and not necessarily a producer or a business owner. And so I had to kind of learn those skills as I go. I had to learn how do you lead a team of people? How do you manage an animation production? How do you charge your clients? How do you manage your production budget? Um, I had to learn all of those soft skills because you, you don't learn them when somebody's teaching you how to use Photoshop or how to use the latest animation software. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I do I call it the University of God Knox. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm there. I'm currently in my fifth year of of university. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, but I do think it's it's such a it's at least for me it feels like it's such a good time right now for our country for animation and just all of the things that are happening, whether it's the individuals who are making their own way or some of the bigger collaborations that are happening with the bigger names. I do think it's a it's a mm. very exciting time for animation. Um, and I do agree with you. But that's having... why... Oh, yeah. Can I go ahead? No, oh. it's just, I just wanted to pick up on, on those on those challenges, you know, that challenge of, you know, so many uh, animation studios, new animation studios, especially having to learn those hard, painful lessons that you just like, the solutions are out there, but just because they isolated and they're alone, they're learning it the hard way. And mm -hmm. it's one of the things that we want to look into as animation is say of, you know, addressing the professionals training programs 
of you know that that journey of moving not just from junior animator to medium to senior and having that certified but also producing and production managing and line producing and all of the business components to have those courses for people um, and these kinds of talks also become critical in just having workshops that people who are skilled in those areas can expose others to. So, you know, I'm really grateful to this uh, um, McGentry and her, her team for organizing something like this, of giving people access to uh, people who have done it before and are able to kind of raise people's awareness to some of the challenges that uh, are experienced by industry players. Mm, I'm so glad you said that. I'm going to do a shameless plug, everybody. So I have a podcast called The Business of Animation Podcast. It's on Spotify. It's on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and wherever else people get podcasts. And that's where I started sharing the journey of being a business owner because I was like figuring it out as I went. And in doing that, I've also been using that podcast not only to share my own journey, but also as an opportunity to learn from other business owners, other people in the industry, and almost like kind of make them my mentors as I as I record the episode with them. But uh, one of the episodes I interviewed Stuart Forrest, the CEO of Triggerfish Animation. So for those who don't know, Triggerfish is currently the biggest animation studio on the African continent in Cape Town. And so I interviewed him because I was like, I want to know how did you manage to do this for 26 years? Because my journey just started. Um, and just listening to somebody who he used to be, you know, he's a creative just like me, but now he's like the paperwork person as the CEO. And just hearing um, what is that journey of making sure that you can rinse and repeat and be sustainable as a business owner in animation in South Africa. Um, and um, that's been one of the ways where I've been, I guess my, it's my personal mission to kind of get that information out into the world, but also to learn from people who have experienced. I mean, one of the things he mentioned in that podcast was that as a, you know, as the bigger they get, the more hierarchy they get, the less in touch he is with the needs of the people working on the projects. And because animators, they just like, keep your head down, work. And as he's making these sort of high level decisions about which direction the business should go, um, it's very easy to kind of leave those people behind in your planning for how the business should go. And, um, I, it made me realize, okay, Cabello, as you grow and as you get better at leading a group of people, don't forget that the people who you're working with are people. And so you need to hear so that you can improve on your process or improve on their work experience. Or if they've got um, ideas and new contributions, new products, new films they want to get made, actually hear them out because they actually have value to bring to you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Well, my, one of my really exciting things, because I'm a, a strategist and my brain loves to like work out how to strategize and solve problems. Uh, but my new excitement is modeling. So, you know, when I designed the, the incubator initially, you know, I was like, I'm not going to wait. I'm, you know, I don't have all the pieces. I don't have all the money, but I'm just going to get it done. So I call it like I'm flying an airplane without all of the pieces in place. I'm like, we'll put the pieces <laughs> as we go. Let's just get off the ground and get going. Yeah. And so one of the things that has evolved is that I've been sort of uh, evolving it into a hybrid model. So, you know, there were elements of the incubator. And in looking at the incubator, I was like, there aren't all the elements of traditional incubation that we fill. You know, we're now getting the office spaces. And so we're addressing one of those elements of the incubator requirements. But there was also elements of the accelerator. And even then, I had to modify the accelerator for one, the fact that, you know, we can't do it in the three to six months like a normal accelerator. Our industry is a, a long process and a mm. slow process. And also now I've added so much to the development process that I had to increase that to a year long process. So I had to modify each bits of the hybrid models that I was incorporating. And most recently, the new element to my hybrid model that I've now evolved the incubator to incorporate is the startup studio model, because I had to keep in mind, you know, the special needs of uh, black creative 
studios in South Africa. So I, I, I fortunately learned at a, a young age that best practice, world case best practice is not necessarily a one size fits all. You've got to modify it to fit in the African dynamic. And so mm. you take the key success elements of that and you look at how do I make it fit for the community that I'm creating. So it's not saying here's the box, box that comes from international best practice, they must fit into that. It's saying, okay, how do I re-strategize this box, redesign it to fit for them so that mm. it works much better. So the startup studio uh, element that I incorporated into the business plan just very recently because we had to submit for a massive fund um, was looking at the fact that, you know, assessing where my SMEs were and realizing that because so many of them are creatives, the minute they, because their next challenge is scaling. So it's preparing them for that big scale into production. And we've got 10 that are in development. So even just the managing of that process is going to be tricky. But in getting them prepared for that scaling, which is one of the big reasons businesses shut down is too fast growth and scaling at a high rate. Um, so I had to look at how do I buffer some of those challenges for them? So the startup studio model really made sense to me and it fitted in. And even with the startup studio model, I had to kind of look at what works and what doesn't work. Um, so, you know, modeling it in a way that the marketing, the HR, the legal, the uh, uh, um, all of the kind of business processes that are very demanding and very heavy that we create a startup studio that has those teams that are there to support them. So they can focus in the area that they are good at, that they're passionate about. And we just put in a CEO, a line producers, various producers and create that kind of support network that all of the projects then go through that machine while they are, 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 are you know, focusing on the, the production component of it. Because the production of animation is complex in itself. That is mm -hmm. a, a huge undertaking in itself. So now to incorporate your e-commerce strategy, your licensing and merchandise, I mean, licensing and merchandise is massive. As big as animation is, <laughs> licensing and merchandise is even more bigger because it's lots of little things and so many different uh, retail deals and licensing deals and so many elements to it. So to create that buffer, and once again, as part of my strategy of in looking at the entire value chain, what are all the big barriers to preventing growth and how do we create those buffers to help make that path a lot easier uh, for SMEs. So yeah, that's my, my new excitement right now is, is modeling and creating hybrid models. <laughs> wow. You guys are just so inspiring. Like not only are you in animation, you guys rock as business women and black business women. Wow. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm not, I'm gonna be I'm gonna be sending you guys proposals. I've got I've got proposals. <laughs> so here are some questions. The first one, and I think this is so fabulous. Uh, just to give a context, we've been talking about the business of animation, but we haven't talked about how much one minute costs how much uh, 10 minutes cost and how much a feature costs. Just give people a kind of overview to blow their minds. <laughs> In a South African context, obviously. Let's let's keep it local. Isabel, do you want to go? I'm going to leave that to you. I'm going to leave that okay, to you. Okay, fine. I'll go. Now, not, this, not is my, this is my favorite question to answer because... How long along, is a string, right? Yes, how long is a piece of string? <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, animation, the cost of it, it depends on so many variables. So it isn't just a quick Google and then you find out how much it costs because first thing you're going to find uh, prices in dollars or in pounds and euros, and it will not translate very well to a South African context because we know what our exchange rate looks like. But the cost of an animation, it depends on firstly, what are you actually making? So your genre. So some genres are more expensive than others. Um, for example, if I'm doing like action fantasy, the production value of that is so much higher than something that's a drama. If I'm doing 3D, 
the cost of that per second is higher than the cost of 2D, for example. Um, and, and then also the, like when I, what I tell my clients, I'm like, if I've got more characters to animate, so there, there's more people talking and there's more intricate movement that makes it more expensive. If I've got a very um, intricate art style. So my, my animation looks like a moving painting that makes it even more expensive. Um, I think yesterday we were in a, a, a conference where it was talking about co-production between New Zealand and South Africa and some of the budgets that came out of there that was a budget that's that's a low budget animation film it's like five million dollars that was the low budget animation film so if you want to compete internationally with the likes of Dis disney etc then you need a hundred million dollars so then i was like okay i'm falling off of my chair because I, uh, where, how, <laughs> where do I even start? So animation, it also becomes expensive because the more animation you make, the more hands. I'm not sure if you've seen the end credits of animated films or mm -hmm. live action films with intense VFX, hundreds of people that we need to pay. Um, you know, the uh, doesn't end. Yeah, yeah I'll <laughs> say one last thing because I do 2D animation. Um, uh, we need to make 24 drawings to make one second of animation so one person needs to make 24 drawings to make one second of animation then you see how why you need more and more people in a production so i'm sorry i didn't give you a flat that's the answer <laughs> no i think it gives people a perspective mm. on the scale that that we're speaking about okay. that question came from chundedo um so we have another question what are some of your experiences and challenges around financing and production skills pool distribution? Guys, this is a whole day's conference, I'm sure, this question. <laughs> but yeah. if you can, uh, <laughs> I've been lucky. I've, 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 had, I've been in a workshop with uh, Isabel, so I, I got the lowdown on, on a lot of the stuff. But obviously, it's, it's very basic. Can you speak to that? Um, just like the challenges in financing, and let's just look at financing and the production skills pool. I think yeah. those are two questions. Yeah. I mean, there's massive pools within the financing area. For one, we we simply have a risk averse investor market, so venture capitalists are just not an option for us because you know one I call them noose money. They're on neck within the first quarter and like. Uh, so it's, it's not ideal for our industry. So that cuts out a huge, and especially in terms of big investment, the venture capital market is, is, is a key one. And, and, and this is part of why we are in the incubator exploring, how do we build business models that show better returns on investment? Um, because we've got to be able to make that business case and get the buy-in of the investors. Um, otherwise, we're always living on that donor funded, government funded, grant funding kind of cycle. And that's not an industry. It's an NGO. You know? <laughs> Until we can show proper business plans and design proper business models, we're simply not going to be able to attract the right money. So it is challenging, but it is also about looking at what are we doing wrong and how do we make ourselves more attractive for the funding? Um, and so when one looks at it from that approach, you start to look at, put yourself in the investor shoe, put yourself in government shoe. If government's one of your funders. What is government's return on investment? What do they want back? I, I'm dealing with that with government wanting to invest in our incubator. In fact, uh, Gauteng province has in, invested in our incubator. And so now they're looking at the, the projects that are coming out of this. They're looking at, I did want to show some, some uh, Z cards, but I don't think we'll have time. Um, and so they're going, can we scale this across the entire province and have hubs in the five corridors of the province? And so their return on investment of what they, they're like, don't, I don't even care what it's going to cost. Just tell us what, how much money you want. And they want jobs. They want massive training. They want youth in internships. They want job creation. So, you know, it's, it's a case of how do we fit with the money right? And, you know, I've got one of those challenges where government is still living in that old era where there was, you know, the factory levels of, of people, um, whereas we're at an infancy stage in our industry. 
and I'm gearing our content. I'm like, before you can go and try and uh, meet the international market and try and compete with international people, how about you actually get your own audiences to love your content? Mm. So can we make it for mm. our people? First and foremost, get your audience, know your target audience, meet their needs, because then you can have the follow-up of meeting their toy needs, their clothing needs, all of the other areas where you can exploit income from your brand. So once we've got that magic uh, uh, piece right, we then go, and now how do we get the rest of Africa in? And uh, you know, is it just about the language shift? How do we incorporate their cultures? Um, and how do we make it more travelable just within our continent? Because once you've mastered that, then you can start saying, okay, with my next project, I'm gonna create something that has more travelability. So I'm not so much looking at my SMEs really trying to, of course, I'm going the slate model, which is one of the, the models that looks at how do we reduce the risk for the investor. And so the slate model helps with that because within that slate, I've got slate one and slate two, and I might be breaking them down into even smaller slates. So uh, slate one, two, and three. Um, and so within those slates, you're going to have those failures, you're going to have those break evens, and then you're going to have that potential runaway hit. So that runaway hit, you kind of can have that uh, coverage uh, for some of the failures. So it creates for that balance. Um, and it was so amazing. We invited IDC to come and do a workshop to our SMEs last year, and they announced that they had just allowed for funding for slates. So I was like, right timing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, the financing is really complex, but it is about looking at how do we make ourselves fit with the money better instead of expect, expecting the money to accept us as, you know, we're creatives, we're filmmakers, it's important to society, it's the arts. Yes, that's all well and good, and you've had a long run of that. Now can you get a return on investment? Mm. Can you get your audience buy-in and get them to love your content and show that love? Through, the, through spending. Um, so yeah, I think there's a big shift that we have to make in order to meet the finance, because the money is there. There is insane money there. And as I'm building this model and people are starting to see that, okay, there's some real strategic thinking around this, there's proper modeling around this, let's start putting the support around it. So but like I said, I'm flying the airplane while I'm building it, but I'm getting the, the traction and the word out there. And so as I get different bits of money, I keep putting the various pieces together. And so we keep going to hopefully a paradise destination. Not too far, far, far from now. Um, yes. So there's a couple of questions that have come up that have to do with the with the skills pool, as well as um, um, the last question that just came in was, how do you move from live action to animation? Um, I feel like we probably need another session just on that as well. However, yeah. um, do you want to just speak? Recommend, I would recommend bringing in uh, people who have done that shift, because I think you will learn so much from right. just the challenges that they went through and the shift they had to make in understanding this, this industry. So I definitely advise doing a whole workshop with people who've done that transition. Yeah, I would actually yeah. add, to add that. to that. I would say, because I when I was in film school, the majority of the students who were there were live action students, and there were like three of us in third year doing animation. And I could feel that even the way this institution was run, an understanding of animation was missing. So just a top level uh, sort of explanation. In animation, we edit our films before we animate them. But in live action, we edit them after we have filmed them. Meaning once you've done your script and storyboard, your, and your storyboards your, your, is your rough animation, essentially. Once you have your storyboard, that's your movie. We're not changing it after this. So that's just the first thing that you need to know is someone transitioning from live action to animation. But I agree, it would help if you had a whole other session um, to, to address that. Uh, can I address the production skills question? Mm -hmm. Sure. Go ahead. Um, I would just say to that, um, one of the challenges is finding a consistent level of talent in South Africa, because not all, um, not everyone is actually studying animation. Some people are self-taught, but then also not all the schools teach to the same caliber. And so what we found to help us solve that problem is 
having a willingness to take in interns who both have like a high level of skill, but maybe lack like soft skills in terms of business and the working world, but also to take in interns where they have that potential there, they're self-taught, but they don't have some sort of um, formal um, training or formal education, but they've got the hunger, they've got the talent and seeing companies have a willingness to take those people in and train them through an internship, which is a harder process. But if we're able to do that, then we're able to have more people who actually have the skill of creating animation. Um, so that's, that's one of the challenges that I see is this, there's just not enough people. Yeah. yeah, it's we've animation is say we've done the market research and there's critical, critical and scarce skill shortages. So from producers, if you do not have enough producers in your industry, you simply cannot grow. They are the, you know, they bring all the pieces together. Um, production managers, uh, line producers, uh, storyboard artists. Like this is going to be a massive challenge for us when we get into pre-production is I set up the internship at Chimolohom specifically to address concept artists because it's all about who controls the narrative in terms of the visual of the animation? Who controls the Africanization of those imagery? Uh, what is cultural African in, <laughs> imagery and animation? So the internship was to address uh, concept art and to address storyboarding. And it was so sad when I spoke to, because I was just consulting and I set it up and you know I supported through a certain phase of it. And after year two, I was, I was out. It was a running machine. I didn't need to be there. And so I asked uh, the Lesejo Forster one day, so how many uh, storyboard artists did we get out of your, the first year incubation? One. One wow. employable out of 20. And this is the problem you're finding in the schools where everybody wants to be a modeler and nobody wants to be a rigger. So we've got massive rigging shortage because rigging is that kind of geometry brain. You've got to have that creative arts and then also that mathematical brain. Um, so we know the statistics on maths in this country. Um, <laughs> and, and then also the business component of people who understand how to run a studio. So all of those critical shortages are really a, a, a huge hindrance to us growing as an industry. So those are some of the things that I'm looking at addressing um, through Animation SA and uh, and so now with the support of the Gauteng province, especially the Gauteng economic development, they are looking at how do we support SMEs in this industry as well as gaming and kind of support massive uh, training. But even then, you know, they put us into a time frame that is near impossible. We said 10 years, they said, okay, three. And we're like, uh, what do you mean three? Do you know how long animation takes? Um, so this Hopefully is Hopefully they can throw some money at it. They are um, throwing so money at it. The, like they are money. The intensive but this is one of those things where we think money is the solution to everything, and it's it not is. always. Um, yeah. So, but it's going to force. What I like about it is that it's going to force us to think innovatively, to think creatively, and really look at how do we strategize and model it in a way that makes it doable. And yeah, they've set the bar really high and it seems near impossible, but sometimes aim for the impossible and see how close you get to it. So we'll give it a try. I have two more questions. They're really quick, hopefully. Um, from Tunde, what, why 2D and why not 3D? So that's one question. Um, and then I'm, I'm throwing in the second question from Ramadan, which is asking, uh, are you creating content for local or international clients, broadcasters or streamers? Just give us a sense of where that's at. So I'm, I'm throwing both those questions in. And those are our last two questions, hopefully. Um, hey, Kabin, you we're, take we're the first one, I'll take the second one. Okay. Um, one, I've been drawing my whole life, so 2D was just a natural, um, what's the word, progression from to use as a, as a form of animation. I just, I drew, so I was like, what if my drawings could move? And then I, I did 2D. But also um, what's quite nice is 2D um, has like a charm about it um, in terms of 
how you the art style that you use to create your 2d drawings um and then also you yeah you would think with with medical you would do 3d and there are opportunities for us to do 3d for our medical clients if they need it um but for the most part we've been working with 2d purely because one i just that was a skill that i had so i started with what i had and then we build as we go to 2d can be quite charming um, and cute to look at and have a, like a really interesting aesthetic. And then three, it's, it's a lot cheaper to do 2D animation than it is to do 3D. So when we were starting out, I was like, this is what I have. When you're a 2D, you can almost be a one-man show. When you're 3D, you, you almost can't be a one-man show. And so then um, that's why uh, we chose 2D. So it isn't really that one is better than the other. It was just that was the skills that we had at the time. And that's what we started with. Uh, but if there's the opportunity to do 3D, we'll do 3D. Yeah. In the incubator, we looked at which projects actually worked better for which format. So there were some projects that we just thought this has to be 2D. It's just, you know, you're allowed that really stylized and really be creative in the look and feel. Um, and then there were some where we were just like, yeah, this is going to work well in 3D. Uh, for the um, African Warrior Queens, you know, we wanted to, uh, the, 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 the producer had gotten pictures of some of these ancient Warrior Queens. And so he was building them with this photo photogrammetry and so it just evolved into being a 3d project and so as he builds these incredible warriors and designs their beautiful fashion and mm. headdresses i was like oh this actually really works well for 3d and then there's some space space uh, series that just work really well for 2d so it, it also depends on what your project is um but yeah i i'd rather let the the medium fit the project than kind of try and just uh, force it to be you know 3d or 2d it's, it's to let it fit properly um now i've forgotten what was the other question again three the other question is about are you creating local content for oh, broadcasters yes. and streamers for yeah. streamers give us a, you know, an idea animation is so complex and if you're a first time producer try and win your local market you know try and win them online I mean, if nobody has watched uh, Unhappy Husband, please watch Unhappy Husband. It cracks me up. He's got like oh, over a million views. He's, uh, it may be cheap and basic 2D animation, but his script, his like language, his, his colloquialisms, his connection to the South African aesthetic and the humor is on point. That, that's how he got all those audiences. So if you can win your audiences, you just keep broadening out and going. Um, you know, there are those who are much more established and have proven themselves and so can start uh, uh, doing stuff that can travel internationally. Um, but yeah, I think for first time producers, uh, try and crack your local markets, try and crack your African markets. Uh, they're great distributors like Africa XP that can help you into getting into the African markets. Um, and this, it is just the market in Africa is so much more robust now than it ever was. Um, and the international markets, you're competing with so many players um, that unless you're looking for a co-production, which is also a really great strategy if you want to do a global production, is do a co-production because you can learn so much from those partners. So, you know, especially looking at the script editing, but also allowing that, you know, not too much of your creative control is lost through that process. Um, the storyboarding, that's a huge thing that if you get a, an international partner on board with that, massive problem solved. So, yeah, strategic co-production partnering, I think, would be the best way to go for international. Before we... That and the fact that the money is, is limited in South Africa. That's true. Um, before we hop off, I actually have a different answer from Isabel with that. We actually, because uh, medical content is the, the type that's educational, that's transferable between Universal. countries. Huh? Come again? <laughs> yeah, so we, we're, we're doing it. Yes, yeah, we're, we're doing international content because we're teaching on a disease. And while the disease might behave differently in different countries, um, we can take our animation and use it in Brazil, for example, if the context is similar to South Africa. And then um, when, with what Isabel said, we actually, we've decided 
we're not aiming for local purely because the means of distributing locally is difficult. <laughs> so we aiming for international and it's mainly because um, the money is, is outside of my country. So whether it's on the African continent or in other parts of the world, and we're creating um, content that isn't just medical, but is also purely for entertainment series and all of that. Mm -hmm. That's where that's where we are. Yeah. But yeah, because it's wow. medical, it's a bit more universal. So we aim for the world. Amazing. Guys, um, so much excitement and hope in, in what you all are doing and uh, where we can go. I just wanted to say, uh, as a matter of reference, Kumba, made by Triggerfish, is actually one of South Africa's highest grossing movies at $28.42 million. I just want to put that out there. Um, yeah, I think that's an exciting fact around animation. <laughs> um, and that came with their second film. Triggerfish has got a very long history and before they even yes. got to make Zambezia, and uh, nice. they learned so much from the Zambezia experience, which allowed them to have that win for, for the next film. But it is South Africa's biggest box office hit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Just in terms of the potential of animation, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I thought that was exciting. But I Thank think that also both. opens up the door between the difference between TV series and feature film. Very right. big different business models, very different scale and challenges. Uh, feature film is for the extremely brave. So I definitely give it up to as uh, <laughs> uh, Stuart and Anthony. Um, big, and we're, we're tackling TV series. We're like, okay, let's let's stay in our lane for now. We'll get there no, one day. Every, and I think that's the beautiful thing about having both of you is to see how, you know, uh, specific and you know, the niche can open up the whole world. Um, so that's that's really exciting. And and building, you know, there's something about holding the vision, but as you say, just start and you, you, you're building out the pathways, creating the, uh, the ecosystem um, that will soon, you know, is already bearing fruit in terms of getting people in and getting people excited and getting the stakeholders in. Very exciting. Thank you both so much, um, honestly, for, for sharing your insights and just rocking that world. Um, I just want to remind people that the Independent Black Filmmakers Collective is a collaborative business to business network and advocacy group that was formed in 2017 by wholly black owned South African film and television companies representing filmmakers, content creators, film and television commercials directors, producers, marketers, and in fact, the entire black value chain in film. Uh, if you haven't joined us yet, uh, please look out for how you can join the Independent Black Filmmakers Collective. We have such exciting things coming up. You wanna join in and get uh, connected with our very awesome network and our awesome members. Thank you all so much to the board, um, to the people behind the scenes, Namsa, Tunde, uh, Ramadan for cu curating the series as well. Um, and especially to the audience members who have participated in the session and thank you for your questions. Uh, I'm sure this particular session is going to inspire many, many people. Thank you very much, both of you. Thank, thank you. you, it's been awesome. <laughs> oh, I didn't say my name's Megantri Pele, and I'm the co-chair of the Independent Black Filmmakers Collector, <laughs> together with Azania Muende. <laughs> um, thanks very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye.